All right, we are back on the air. Dr. Mike, good morning, good afternoon. Good morning, good afternoon. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good. I got my coffee. It's uh, 6 a.m. in Sydney. It's actually just gotten really cold since the last time we caught up. So it was pretty much the first day of May and something just rolled in and it's been pretty cold ever since. So, so that's wild. The whole, the whole, uh, what does that be? That'd be a hemisphere thing, right? How it's the, the, the seasons flip. So it's just starting to get warm over here and it's just, uh, just starting to get cool for you. Now what's, What's a cool temperature for a, uh, I guess, a Sydney day? Yeah, I don't know how it compares because we're Celsius versus Fahrenheit, I guess. But uh, yeah, I don't know. We've had a few days this week where it's sort of getting down around seven degrees overnight. Um, I don't know what that. It, it it's roughly like double, I think, 40, isn't it? Forty something, right? Because zero degrees is thirty-two degrees, right? Okay. That's like the uh, be forty-ish, so pretty chilly. So yeah, so when we were in Boston, that was minus two overnight. So we've still got some way to go, but it's it's still pretty cold. So yeah, uh, yeah. It's but it's not too bad. I don't. I'd rather the cooler weather than the the blazing heat. I think so. <laughs> it's got to get pretty hot in the summer too, right? Yeah, it seems to be slowly getting a bit hotter um, over the years. So. Mm-hmm if you're in the camp of global warming, then maybe there's something going on, but uh, who knows? That's a whole, it's a whole nother podcast, right? Yeah. We, 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 uh, <laughs> we don't want to go down too many dangerous roads. We've already, we've already dabbled in some things like flat earth stuff. <laughs> did you, did you get onto YouTube and, and go down that rabbit hole at all? I've been, um, my YouTube rabbit hole has been uh, antiques roadshow lately. <laughs> so, do they have that? Are you familiar with antiques roadshow? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so just like seeing the reaction on people's faces when they find out that this thing that they found in a garage sale for thirty dollars is worth like seven hundred grand. It's just like it's the coolest thing to watch. Some old ladies like, yeah, I found this in an old garage sale, and I had to convince my husband to give me thirty bucks, and then it turns out to be three quarters of a million dollars, and they're like panicking it's a very it's a very addictive thing to uh to watch i think the reverse of that is also particularly cool when someone has been holding on to this amazing heirloom for many years and they think it's going to be worth millions and it's worth about two bucks so yeah. that's all <laughs> <laughs> they sold millions of them in a drugstore in like 1958 and everyone has a thousand of them and yeah that's brutal it's, that's, that's like what happened with the baseball cards in the united states at least is it became this like collectible collectible thing and in becoming so collectible they mass produced them and becoming so mass produced, it really drove the value of them down. So, I mean, there, there's your beautiful lesson in, uh, in economics right there. There was actually a woman who had, um, this might be a very region specific thing, but she had like the first set of baseball cards from the, the Boston Red Sox. They were called the Boston Red Sockings back in the day. So I don't know how much baseball is watching in Australia. And she had them signed. And they stayed at like her family's bed and breakfast and it signed the guest book. So she had like all this provenance. It was checked out. Everything worked out well. And the, the baseball cards, there was like 12 of them ended up being $1.5 million. And she almost had a freaking brain aneurysm at that point. So yeah, baseball Damn. cards. Are- but you mass produce anything. It, sometimes you want the price to go down, right? That's the whole point. Um, other times, if you're trying to hold on to something that you perceive to be valuable, the, uh, the number of them floating around is, is really where you make your money. Yeah. I, I got into collector cards when I was, uh, when I was a young man uh, and I loved it. And my theory was that these are going to be worth a fortune one day. So it seemed like a, a good investment for the few dollars that I had at the time. Um, I think they're still locked away somewhere maybe at mum and dad's but i'm pretty sure they're worth nothing more or less and i've got a a full set of batman returns cards which i was very proud of and it's worth fuck all (laughs) (laughs) you couldn't give them away people would use them as firewood or toilet paper no it's prime toilet paper money there 
Yeah, toilet paper is a very prized asset these days. Apparently, coronavirus makes you shit your pants. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, I've been on the toilet 24-7. I don't even know. I've just got one of those little TV dinner trays. I just eat and shit right there and then. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we got on the agenda today? So we are episode three and... So I've got to apologize to our four or possibly five listeners because we're a week late with this one and that is my fault by proxy of the post service because we were waiting for this to show up um, and it took two and a half weeks to come from Melbourne, which is the southern part of Australia. So not too far away. Normally it would take about two and a half days, but I think what's happening is there's no domestic air travel um, it's in the country. So most things are moving around by road. Uh, so I think that's why we had a bit of a delay there, but, uh, Hey, it's worth it. We're here and we're up to number three on our list of seven, which means we're talking about some symptoms today. Symptoms. Beautiful thing. This is one of my favorites, I think out of the, out of the group. Yeah. Cause this one causes, well, I don't know. I feel like everything that we talk about has some degree of, uh, of controversy to it, but respecting symptoms is the one that draws the most ire from other healthcare practitioners because there's this movement right now that symptoms don't matter, right? There's this notion that, well, where you feel symptoms is not correlated to where your dysfunction is so why am i going to even look at it but if we again understand the first two principles that we've gone over again load versus capacity respecting pathology having tissue specific diagnoses if you know enough about symptomatology right it all still makes sense that the symptom has to match the pathology. The pathology has to match the, the load versus the capacity and it all just fits in in a nice, beautiful cyclical way. But again, it, it takes a lot of work to understand which types of pains are coming from which types of tissues uh, and you know, to, to understand the entire human body takes a lot of flipping work. <laughs> Yeah, um, and we talked about last time about how this interpretation job that the role that we have is a difficult thing to do and to to get it right. And this is this is where that really sort of comes to the forefront, I think, in interpreting symptoms because um, it's such an important part to get it right, but it is still a difficult part. And you know, perhaps it's not really done well everywhere. Um, because it is hard and you know the thing for me i think that really um this highlighted is the importance of slowing down to actually to get there um so we'll get into that a little bit but i wanted to just uh break down what's a symptom because you know we've got two words in this we're respecting symptoms and so we touched on what respect is last week where that's really um it's paying attention so it's giving attention to something is what we're talking about here but so then what's a symptom how would you explain a symptom to someone a symptom is a well to me what i'm looking for when i ask about a symptom or when i'm diving deeper into what a symptom is i want a location and i want a sensation so i'm looking for that because in the back of my head i have a database right of which type of symptoms will correlate to which type of tissue injuries so it's a clue right if you're the hardy boys or or scooby-doo and whatever i don't know (laughs) <laughs> I have no idea. Whatever the Australian Scooby Doo is, maybe I just sound ignorant. Maybe yeah, no, I read Hardy Boys books when I was a young oh, man. So good, there you good, go. Good, good. I don't want to sound like the dumb American because, um, <laughs> but that's what a symptom is. It's a sensation and a location. Um, particularly in the musculoskeletal world, generally, you can make that assumption in in in, in most cases. In throughout medicine in general. Um, you know, is it tingly? 
Is it numb? Is it burny? Is it deep? Is it achy? Is it sharp? Is it dull? What is it, right? What type of sensation are you feeling? What is the quality of that sensation? And quality is like that specific, I guess, modifier that you would describe it as location. Is it pinpoint? Is it broad? Is it following the pattern of a dermatome? Is it following the pattern of a sclerotome? Is it following the pattern of a, a, a peripheral, well, I, guess, I would say a, a superficial nerve, right? Um, you know, how bad is it, right? We have to then not only qualify that symptom, locate that symptom, but we have to know what the intensity of that symptom is. Is it one out of 10? Is it two out of 10? Is it 10 out of 10? So all of these things matter and give us clues as to what's going on. And then they can give us clues as to, you know, whether or not this condition is something that we can easily fix or not. Yeah. They're, they're data points. And what's interesting about it is that it's, it's a felt experience by the patient. It's not something that we can, we can feel ourselves because it's, it's their interpretation and what they're feeling and what they can tell us. And so the things that we measure that we can observe uh, what you call clinically as a sign, but the symptom is more something that the, the patient knows themselves. And so our job is really as we're the data collectors, we have to, we have to be the ones that can ask the right questions to get the right data out. And then we have to actually pull all this together, make sure that we've got it all. And then it's kind of like interpreting all that. And these are all pieces of a puzzle that have to all kind of come together. And, and so if you're missing a piece of that puzzle, um, you know, you can't complete that, that picture. Um, so it's a, it's a tricky job and I kind of, you know, I'm formerly an IT guy, so I, I sort of think about things in, in a technical way sometimes, but these are just, these are purely data points. And, um, you know, sometimes we have to, uh, as IT engineers, we would have to translate data from different systems, for instance. So we might do an upgrade on a system. It's going to spit out a whole lot of data. And it doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense when you just see all this data in a text file or a spreadsheet or something, but it fits into different columns. And then we've got to map that through to new columns for a new system so that it makes sense over there. And that's kind of what our job is, I guess. We've got to make sure that we get all of the right data points. We fit it together in the right way, make it, have it make sense and then have it spit out at the other end. Uh, and that that could be tricky. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. I mean, you know, you're you're the the XIT guy professionally. I'd like to call myself like a recreational techie. So it's like it's all inputs in a program, right? And then depending on how great your program is, which is another way of saying depending on how skilled your physician is at, at diagnosing, it, he can either package that into a beautiful, or she, excuse me, they can either package that into a beautiful output, right? The inputs go in, the program works, it's magic, boom, pumps out an output, or they just seem to be these unrelated, um, unconnected pieces of data point that gets run through the program, and now it's like, what does this mean? So the, the ability of the physician to actually crunch that data is, is, is going to be largely the value of that program or that physician. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you've got to have the tools at hand to be able to interpret these things. And, uh, you know, I carry around with me, um, like some of these charts, you mentioned the dermatomes, sclerotomes, peripheral nerves, and we can explain what that is, but, that's three different types of maps throughout the entire body. Uh, and it's not just something that you can have sitting in your brain and, and be totally confident that works. You need, I think anyway, maybe it's just me, but I need a reference point to actually go back and look at it. So um, I carry that around with me so that I can get it right. I mean, I, I carry it to the clinic where I need it. I don't take it to fucking Audi when we're doing the grocery shopping or something. <laughs> but, yeah, but otherwise I've got it with me. But, you know, it's just because it's a complex thing and you've got to get it 
accurate. So um, it's, I think it's not good enough to just be able to sort of go, oh, it looks like it's L4, 5, we'll just sort of call it that. It's got to be a bit more specific. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a tricky one. Yeah, because that's where, that's where you'll make mistakes is the things that look like something, but they're, they're really um, another thing, right? Right. Uh, you know, is a nerve stuck at the carpal tunnel or is a nerve stuck up at the elbow? Right. They'll, they'll both present with numbing and tingling into the hand. Um, it, it's the difference of a half a finger sometimes, right? You have that, that, that um, I don't know, I can't think of it right now because I'm on the chart in front of me, but it's the middle finger, right, is what would differentiate between, um, you know, median nerve entrapment at, the pronator muscle or median nerve entrapment at the carpal tunnel. So that's why you get sometimes these carpal tunnel surgeries that ultimately fail. And we've talked about this before is you, know, you could have a nerve entrapment at the median or at the pronator teres muscle. And in reality, your orthopedic surgeon thinks it's at the carpal tunnel, goes in and fixes the carpal tunnel. All of a sudden you come out maybe a little bit better. You have some um, nerve tension release there, but you, you, you still have that main entrapment at the pronator, then you've got big issues. So those are just very, very little details that will help make you, you know, 100% right versus 90% right. And 100% right versus 90% right could be three or four visits. And three or four visits can mean you know, anywhere from 150 to, to $250. So, you know, that's a big deal for a lot of patients and it should be a big deal. So it's those little intricacies that matter. Is it L4, L5, or is it L5, S1, right? Are you getting that sacroiliac joint deep achiness or are you getting a little bit of something radiating around into your hip? It's a really, really big difference. I mean, and we're not even getting into, is it your actual sacroil sacroiliac joint versus right. is it a sclerotogenous disc pain referral pattern from L5S1. So those little decisions make a huge difference. And, you know, the structure that you determine is the root cause of the issue may only be an inch apart, but makes a big difference. It's what separates you from a decent doctor to an outstanding one where people travel the world to come see you and pay lots of money to come see you and you get everyone better that you could possibly get better. Yeah. And so, you know, there's, there's certain questions that we ask, right, of a, of a patient when we do an intake and sometimes that process, uh, it just needs to take as long as it takes because we've got to go through that. But, um, the whole point of that process is to try and get all these data points out so that we can understand where the pain's coming from. If there's, if there's pain in this situation, but what's causing it. So I, and you sort of touched on this earlier, but there's really like three kind of key things in terms of symptoms that we're really interested in. And, and there's some sub sub sort of brackets underneath those. Um, so let's run through those. Hey, um, and the first thing that we're going to ask someone in terms of symptoms is going to be, where is it? I need to know very precisely exactly. Show me, show me where it is and I'm going to draw it on a map. Um, and so if we do that and we get that and we have our little map from there, we need to actually go, right. What is precisely underneath that? What is the tissue there? So we've got local tissue that can hurt. And then we want to think about what is everything else that can refer into that remotely. Um, so we've got two different things and it's like, we want to be able to actually put a finger on that area and say, I know everything that's underneath here. And these are all the tissues that can hurt. Uh, and then I've got to go away and look at some of these charts and stuff like that and think, what is everything else that can refer into there, which is an even bigger picture. So just to get that location piece is how, I mean, how important is that? That's, that's really fu fundamental, right? Um, but it's, it's a big piece of work right up front. Yeah, and, and it has to be very specific. I mean, right side, lower back, that doesn't give me anything. That's a right. very elementary location. So a lot of times they'll point to it 
you know, I'll have them literally stand up and point to it. I'll say, okay, if you had a paintbrush and you were to paint every um, cubic centimeter of pain that you're experiencing, where is it? And that gives them like this kind of very tangible understanding. It's like, okay, well, you know, it's happening in through here. It's happening in through here. It's going up my arm, things like that. And, and yeah, you're right. Location can be that location specifically, or it could be a pain referral pattern. It could be a dermatome you know, you, you name it. So it's like that narrows it down a little bit or I'd say a lot of it, but you're still far away from your answer with just the, the location and, and, and there's tricks that you can then use based on the rest of your history that can kind of help further narrow it down. Um, you know, more, more likely going to be the quality of the pain, which is the next thing that I think we're, we're getting into. Segway alert, the quality of the pain can give you a really, really, really big clue as to whether it's local tissue or it's a, it's a pain referral pattern. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, a lovely segue there. But that is the next question, right? So if we have that location down and maybe it's the right lower back. So the next question is, well, tell me what it feels like. And, and so this is where we're starting to differentiate between something that is maybe very local, which could be that very sharp kind of, I can put my finger on it. It's very, it's very clear versus something that's much more broad, much more diffuse, uh, might be that achiness, that sort of deep kind of feeling. And then we're starting to think about, okay, where's that coming from? Because it doesn't sound like it's local. But then we've got other qualities as well. So if we're getting something that's burning or uh, something that's got an electric sort of quality about it, then we're thinking that there's some neuro tissue involved. So all of these words that come out and, you know, there's not too many of them. There's not too many ways to describe some of these things because they are fairly specific, uh, but it's all giving clues about what's going on. And then that's going to send us as providers down a different, a different chart because then we're starting to think if, if there's a burning feeling, we're going, okay, well, there's some, some neurological quality here. So we're going to have to look at the dermatomes. We're going to have to look at the peripheral nerves. We're probably not too worried about sclerotomes. Um, so you're already starting to, to get an idea of what's going on there. But uh, man, that's still a process. You gotta, you know, if you don't have those words there to match that location, then everything's on the table. So it's, uh, it's a tricky one, but, uh, the, the information is there most of the time. Um, it's not always clear straight up, but it's usually there. And, you know, I guess to give, uh, to give our patients some confidence, you know, and I'm sure you do this as well, but we'd go back and have a look at these histories sometimes that we've taken and some of these things that we've written down and, you know, sometimes there's a word there that you didn't quite see last time when you looked at it. And on second look, it just goes, there it is, you know, um, and, and sometimes that's all you need. So, um, yeah, this process at the start, I don't know if sometimes um, as a patient, you just kind of think, I oh, just get on with it. I just want some treatment here. But, uh, you know, this is, you can't under, understate the importance of going through this process and, and doing it really thoroughly. Yeah, one word could change your entire diagnosis. So if we're sitting there and we're prodding and we're asking, we're saying, well, what about this? Well, what do you feel? How much does it go up when you squat? How much does it go up when you sit down? Does it, does it stay deep and achy when you sit down? Do you start to get some burning sensation? You know, does it go down into your, your calf? Does it only go to your knee? All those things, like, believe me, I'm not asking you anything that is not ridiculously important, right? I mean, I could talk, I could have a conversation with a wall, but when I'm in that professional setting, like, I'm not interested in anything outside of what I need to know in that history. So if I'm asking a question, it's because I need to know it. Now when we're getting the treatment and we're becoming friendly and all this other stuff, I'll ask you how your dog's doing. I'll ask you how everything else is doing. But, uh, you know, we're hyper-focused in that exam and everything has a, a very specific purpose. So if you're starting to get annoyed that um, 
you know, we're asking too many questions or why does it matter if it hurts me at night or why does it matter this and that? Trust us, it matters. Yeah, it all matters. I think, um, <clears throat> I can't, uh, it was something that I heard, I don't know, fairly recently, I can't remember, but it, it was just that details matter and, and it does, you know, like just because this happened to me recently, I was looking back at a, at a, a file and just looking over the data and the, um, the history and exam that I'd done and something just jumped out and it, it, it filled in a gap that was probably the reason why I was looking at it because something just didn't quite fit. And so, you know, being able to retrofit that back into what I had thought was the problem and, uh, and that made sense. That was great. You know, that worked, but it, it is that the details matter. And so it's a, you know, as a provider, it's a real skill. It's not like we, um, you, you wake up and you have this, skill one day it's something that that you develop and uh it's got so many facets to it because it's a human um relation tool you need to be able to make someone comfortable you need to be able to talk to them in a way where they feel comfortable to be able to give you this information uh and at the same time as you're building that rapport with them you're having to do all of the technical work so actually make sure that you're processing this properly you've understood what they just said and then you're going to ask the right question on the back of that. Um, man, that could be hard. It's a skill. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's not one that again, that you just develop overnight. You have to do it by asking a ton of the same questions to a lot of different people, start recognizing patterns yourself. Uh, consult with people who are also experts at it and, and understanding what they think. So it's, you know, the, the, the history should be so good such that you should be like 80% sure at least of the diagnosis before you even touch or put your hands or measure anything. I mean, it, it's going to be a hundred percent after your exam, but the history you should be almost 80% with. And that only happens by taking a lot of histories, developing those skills, learning which questions that you need to ask when, learning when to shut up, learning when to speak, all of that stuff just comes with repetition and, and you can go to a school and they can drill it and you can take histories from actors and all this other stuff. But um, and until you get into the trenches, you have no idea, but the rewards really, really outweigh the struggle it takes to actually get to it. Yeah. And I think you, in most cases you really get one shot at it too. So, <laughs> you know, you've really got to be on point and show up ready to go. So yeah, huge. So we've got our location, we've got our quality, which has given us a huge piece of the picture already, but the next one's the intensity, right? So these are the questions that we're asking. What is it most of the time in terms of let's use a scale out of 10 with zero being almost or being nothing. One being very, very mild, 10 being absolutely intolerable. Where does it sit most of the time? Where does it sit when it's at its least? Where does it sit when it's at its worst? Um, and that kind of fills in that symptomatic picture quite a lot, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, depending, so you always have to take the intensity question with a bit of a grain of salt um, relative to how you interpret that person's emotional state. Yeah, it might even open up some more line of questioning depending on what you get, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so you always try to, um, sorry, allergies, you always try to set it as a reference, because if, I mean, if it's a true 10 out of 10 pain, you've no business being in my office. Um, so when I start to see eight out of 10, nine out of 10, 10 out of 10, that's where I start to hesitate a little bit and think, okay, maybe there's not that, no, not that your pain isn't serious if you've had it for a substantial period of time, but you know, if you fall and you've got 10 out of 10 pain in your leg, you're not in the right spot. Um, so 
that's where the intensity really comes in. It, 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 to me, it's kind of an opportunity for me to look and say, hmm, is this something that I'm actually going to have a clue about, right? Sharp pain, very, very localized, 10 out of 10, got some, some, some issues right there. Or 10 out of 10 pain, multiple spots, you know, there's really no aggravating um, single event. Now I'm also starting to think that this may not be for me for a little bit of a different reason. So that intensity is almost, not only is it a starting data point, right? That's what most people think of it as, most physicians think of it as. It's like, okay, it's six out of 10 today when we started. When I see it eight times, it's gone down to three out of 10. That's a sign of great progress, but it's a filter for me mostly in that first visit where are we actually going to be a good match? Would you be better off in the emergency room? Would you be better off seeing a behavioral therapist? Would you be better off going, taking magic mushrooms and, and blasting off and seeing if that helps? So all of that plays into it. And that's, again, it's kind of like that, that last filter for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, as you, well, I'd look as you say, like if you get a a ten out of ten is either not a true ten out of ten. It might be ten out of ten for that person, but it's not a ten out of ten for us. Or it's so acute in some sort of phase of injury that, as you say, it's it's probably better served somewhere else, or at least you know perhaps we it's something that we can help later down the track. But uh, yeah, super super important data yeah and if you got somebody that's a one out of ten that's when that's when i'll take some extra time and actually try to understand what the, their, their motivation is for being there because there's a lot of people that are 10 out of they're one out of 10 pain walking around that have no incentive whatsoever to spend their hard-earned money cash time to to go see a physician so it's like somebody one out of tens me I'm like, okay, there's something going on here that we haven't quite discussed. Um, and so that's when I'll try to prod a little bit deeper just to understand their motivation because if it's a one out of 10 pain, right, I cannot use that as a quality um, progress marker. It, it, there's just not enough magnitude in that measurement or in that subjective feedback for me to say, okay, you know, you're not going to go one out of 10 pain, six minutes down the road. Oh, I'm, I'm 0.73 out of 10 pain. So yeah, we've had a 27% improvement. Wow. That's crazy. So I have to then take a look at that and say, okay, what else can I gather from this history to where, you know, I can use that as another progress marker outside of, you know, our objective progress marker. So it's like, do you have trouble bending down to play with your kid? It's like, oh yeah, like that's really why I'm here because I want to age gracefully and play with my kid and roll around on the floor, even though it doesn't cause me a ton of pain. Right. So now you're like, oh shit. Well, how long does it take you rolling around on the floor before you get in pain? And they're like, well, usually four minutes. So boom, now I've got it. Now I've got that data point. So that's where I will start to steer in on the other extreme on, on, on the pain intensity. It's like, I have to, it, 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 it steers you a little bit differently. Yeah. I think for, you know, for our, if we have any patients that do listen, and it's not just our moms that, that watch this, it, it, hopefully in the future, but I think, uh, you know, if anything comes out of this conversation, it's that um, the reasons for doing this process at the start and for taking the time to do it. And if it takes a while, that's okay. Um, because it's, it, you can't understate the importance of it. And, you know, we're only just covering the symptoms, which is at the very front end of the history. And I think if I was able to take any portion of uh, history and that was all I was going to get. I think this would be close to being the, the part that I would want because if I've got a, if I've got the, the demographics, so the age and age sex, um, if I've got the location, the quality and the intensity, then I can already start to formulate something, something um, there's, there's really good information there. And so 
you know, if that process ever becomes frustrating as a patient that, that we harp on this, uh, it's for good reason. And it's because we are trying to do our absolute best to steer well away from the idea that these things are non-specific and we're trying to be very specific um, because there is a map to most of this stuff. And, you know, the, the idea that you just have non-specific mechanical low back pain and you're going to get better and you will get better. I mean, that's for sure. But, but what then, you know, what happens when you feel better in, in a couple of months? Um, we've got to get on top of that problem. We've got to stop that happening again. We've got to understand why it happened in the first place and remove those blocks. So, you know, it needs to be specific. Um, and it, it frustrates me that there's still that those words still exist, that there's still, there's still literature published around the idea that uh, it's, you know, it's just a puzzle that we can't solve. And so we just call it non-specific and everyone gets better from it. And, you know, and if that was okay, it wouldn't be such a massive fucking burden worldwide. Um, I don't know. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it, you're calling it non-specific because you don't have the tools to specify it. Straight up. You, you don't have the tools to specify it. And the tools are there. You can go out and, and, and find those tools. You can Google those tools. You can understand those tools. And, and very specifically in the, in, the, in the diagnostic realm when it comes to symptoms, those tools are out there. They're in the charts of your netters book that you had in your first year of school. It's all there. 100 percent so it's the phys it's on the physician to do that it's 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 their fault so now they have they have a hole in their game due to no one's fault but their own and then they have the audacity to say mm, shoot man we can't figure this out well you know if you were trying to hammer a nail and all you had was a screwdriver, <sighs> fuck man, we can't figure this out. Of course, you don't have the tool because you didn't go to the fucking Home Depot and buy a goddamn hammer and that's it, it's your fault. So yeah, maybe it costs money, yeah, maybe it costs time to acquire the skills, to acquire the knowledge and to use them, but you can't sit there and look your patient in the face and say, mm, we don't know. So we're going to give you three sets of 10 McKinsey back extensions. Then we're going to throw some heat and some stim on it. We're going to give you some core strength exercise because your core is weak, which you have no fucking metric to measure that whatsoever. We're going to stretch your hamstrings. You didn't measure their hamstring flexibility and they're going to feel better in seven to 10 days, not because of you, but in spite of you. And they're going to hurt again in six months and you're gonna do the same thing and you're gonna fix them and it's gonna happen again in three months and then all of a sudden three months is gonna to turn to six weeks. Next thing you know, they've got surgery. So just because you tried to fucking hammer a nail with a screwdriver and you didn't wanna go and get a darn hammer You've cost somebody thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and their back and their body will never, ever, ever be the same because you're lazy and ignorant. <laughs> How often do you think you deal with sclerotogenous pain in practice? Pretty frequently. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. And most most lower back pain when it's non acute i would say these sometimes even acute lower back pain but most lower back pain to me is sclerotogenous right your disc is irritated in some way shape or form you're getting sclerotogenous pain referral to very very specific um spots in your lower back so the the sclerotomes were like a day in one class, in one lecture. You read my mind. <laughs> and it blows my mind. I, 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 <clears throat> Dr. Bufolco, if you're listening, 
thank you for being the only person at National University of Health Sciences to even discuss sclerotogenous pain referral patterns. Because when I started to figure it out, everything clicked. Right, you have you have a, a a disc that's compressed and irritated and sclerotogenal sclerotogenously referring pain. You decompress that disc by inducing more range of motion and flexion, and all of a sudden, your sclerotogenous pain is gone. So that blew my mind. Yeah, agreed. But this is the thing. Um, I I was thinking about this recently, trying to remember how much um, we got taught so far about sclerotogenous pain and it's man i can't remember much hey and even just um to find sclerotome pain referral charts that are really good and easy to use it's really hard. fucking hard to find them uh and you know outside of id i'm not really you, i don't see it very much and you don't see it talked about a lot and uh it definitely yeah, I couldn't find access to the, I mean, the ones that I've got are okay, but once you try to zoom in on them, you lose, it's all pixelated and shit. Like, you know, I'm glad I've yeah. got it, but it's not fantastic. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's a common presentation, I think. And it's, it's amazing because, you know, when I sort of see stuff coming to the, the intern clinic, for instance, um, it, referred pain, I think is on most people's radar as being nerve root related and so if we can if we can rule that out or well, it's either that or a trigger point and so if either of those things are gone then okay you know we're good but yeah i think sclerotogenous referral is massive um yeah no no and the thing about the whole like sclerotome versus dermatome thing is I've seen maybe a handful of dermatome pain referral patterns. And of the ones that I see, a lot of times those are surgical cases to where it's like, dude, your disc is touching a nerve root or you've got arthritis that's blocking off a nerve root. It's going to be very, very, very difficult for me to fix that. Right. I mean, you can remove the adhesion. Sometimes you get some range of motion improvements, and in those range of motion improvements, you take a little pressure off the disc, take pressure off the disc, sucks the disc back in place. Maybe, right? But it's like it, it, it's so much more sclerotome than it is dermatome, yet we focus so much time on dermatome in school and, and nothing on the sclerotome. And it, and it aligns itself with the therapies that most people believed to be gospel, right? So if you have this sclerotogenous pain referral pattern from a disc compression or irritation, um, McKinsey back extensions don't make any sense whatsoever, right? Right. It's like, okay, I have this compressed disc that's causing referred pain and let me just compress this disc a little bit more for you. It makes no sense whatsoever. The dermatome theory could make a little bit more sense with the McKinsey, but I mean, that's really where I think that is, is people are already, people are afraid of spinal flexion. They want you to be as extended as possible, particularly in the lumbar spine. And so they choose their little pain theory, um, their pain theories to match that. Yeah, and the McKenzie dude wrote his book, I think, in about 1985. So we are going back a little bit. And for those five people that are watching, what this is is a guy called Robert McKenzie. I think he was a New Zealander from memory. And he was helping someone that had back pain. And this guy was on the the guy with pain was on a table and he was on his tummy and he essentially was, it had been in a lot of pain. He pushed his trunk up so that he was kind of doing a push up where he then extended his back and his pain went away. Uh, and so some sort of light bulb went off for Mr. McKenzie and um, he's theorized since then that you could essentially put the spine in the opposite position to the one that it got injured in and the mechanics of that would push the injured disc um, back into the segment 
over time um, and this would be the, the, the saving grace for back pain around the world. Um, and for some people, it seems to, to give some sort of symptomatic relief because they, that postural change, it, it does create some changes. And if there is some compression that's going on by a disc that's, uh, that's pushed backwards and touching on something that's sensitive, it, it's taking that away a little bit. So uh, it does, in some cases, seem to do something. In some people, it makes them a shitload worse. Um, but it, it is very non-specific uh in that sense and yeah so there's been a whole sort of movement around uh, mckenzie techniques i think there's even a mckenzie institute where you can go uh and learn these things in in depth i don't know i i don't know much about it um uh, yeah but, i mean it, go ahead sorry yeah no i was just gonna say look i, I don't know much about it so i, I can't talk any shit but uh, i mean it's a symptom management tool right is really what it comes down to. It's the same symptom. It's in the same vein as taking a Tylenol or heat or ice or interferential current. It's, it, it's symptom management that doesn't really fix the issue long term. And, you know, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves there. And, and, you know, if you manage symptoms and don't fix the issue long term, you're actually causing more destructive um, you're, you're causing more destruction, which maybe is why conspiracy theory alert, maybe it's why orthopedic surgeons love McKinsey so much because you get yourself out of symptoms nicely, you get back to work, you hurt your back again, you cycle through that six, seven times, and hmm, yeah, we tried all the conservative measures that we could possibly fathom. The only thing left for us to do is charge your insurance company $40,000 and cut into your back. Yeah, it's yes, yes, been there, <laughs> and it sucks. <laughs> I'm not mincing words today. You you got me fired up. I love it, but you know, like a lot of this stuff is we're talking about symptoms, and a lot of the stuff out there is aimed directly at symptoms. And you know, last week I took an exam for electrophysical therapy, and you just mentioned in interferential current which was one of the things that we did. And, you know, a lot of people for our, our five viewers, a lot of, some of you might be interested in tens. You may have heard of that before, which is essentially whacking an electro pad on an area and it buzzes and it twitches and feels a little bit better, but it's just like taking a, a neurofin for your, for your muscle or something like it's, you know, we're just talking about symptoms uh, and symptomatic relief and you take that thing off and then shit, it hurts again. And you know, that's where a lot of this stuff comes in. And so in, in those, in those cases in, and in being prescribed those, uh, those interventions, the symptoms don't really matter. Like the details in the symptoms don't matter. Um, and so all the things that we've just spent the last half hour talking about in terms of the, the depth of the location information and the, uh, you know, the quality of it and all of these things, it, it just doesn't really matter because you're just going to go after the lowest hanging fruit and see what happens. Yeah. I mean, symptoms do matter to me at least uh, only in a sense that it gives us a data point to direct to where the injured tissue is. So again, you can, you can have a set of symptoms, not care what's causing those set of symptoms and just fix those symptoms and you'll have those symptoms come back again in two weeks. Or you can understand that those symptoms are a function of a specific tissue, correlate that specific tissue with your functional exam, with your actual exam, find out what's going on and, and tack it. So, you know, again, we love covering up symptoms in this medical model period throughout the world. So if you have diabetes, right, we've, we've used this example a couple of times, you know, if you, sorry, my, my mother-in-law just screamed. So if you have <laughs> diabetes, metformin is your symptom manager. Correct. So it's going to go in there. It's, it's going to fix your blood sugar levels. Everything's going to be great, but you could still be very unhealthy and overweight, right? 
So the, the true intervention for diabetes and we'll specify in type two, because you know, maybe the six people watching right now, somebody's got type one diabetes and they're going to give us a one star review. But the real management, the real cause of diabetes is, a, is an imbalance in the amount of sugar that you're consuming versus the amount of sugar that you can consume, largely based on your body fat and diet and things like that. So, you know, you take the blood test and you see that your, your blood sugars are high. That's your symptom, right? You have two options in order to actually fix that symptom. You can go and attack the root cause, which is being heavy, poor diet, poor sleep, underactivity, or you can just try to cover up that symptom. Metformin. Same thing in musculoskeletal world. You can have back pain at your sacroiliac joint. Somebody can either approach it from a symptomatic standpoint at treatment and say, okay, I'm going to throw a TENS unit, heat, ice, blast you up. We're going to put some KT tape. I'm going to give you this Theragun to, to take home or here's some band stretches. Or I can say, I'm going to improve the actual flexion of your L5, S1 vertebral complex take off some of that pressure on that actual disc. And now I've fixed the function. And in fixing that function, I've consequently eliminated your symptoms and you're not going to get it again. So that's really the, the, the two main approaches that you can take to fixing anything from a medical standpoint, manage symptoms, you can attack root causes. Everybody likes to claim that they're attacking root causes, but very few people actually do. Cause again, it's flipping hard to find the root cause and it's flipping hard to fix then that root cause. And it's much easier for me to bill your insurance company $22 for heat stim and an adjustment than it is to sit here and say, I'm operating outside of the medical insurance model and I'm going to do this my way because I know my way is right because I've worked my ass off to understand things. So How's that? You've got the, the, the easier path versus the more difficult yet more rewarding path. Yeah. And all of those things that you listed off in terms of the tape and the Theraguns and you know, all the stim and all those things that is like right now, that is what is common right now. And you know, I don't want to go on too much of a rant. I think I've already done that a bit today, but it, that's kind of what is, you know, you go on social media, that's kind of what is cool right now. Like you get a, some fucking model with big titties and she's holding Theraguns everywhere and people are buying that shit. Like why? I need why? to get big titties. <laughs> I mean, maybe yeah, I'll it get, sounds maybe good, right? I'll maybe that's titties. episode four. <laughs> I'll do manual adhesion release just like this. Um, release adhesion and all of a sudden I make soft will, tissue great again yeah <laughs> everybody will be lined up to come to my office just massive double d's but this is the problem right it's the stuff that is put out there and it it appears to be that this is what you do um and it's just crap and like, you know if you dig you dig into the there is some studies on this stuff and it doesn't do much maybe there's a little psychological boost from having some k tape all over you before you go and do a crossfit workout but you know man i'm sure you've tried that shit i have definitely and it you know <laughs> it doesn't really help yeah and I, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of sheep out there and Folks who understand that there are a lot of sheep out there uh, are more likely to become wolves. And whether you think that an Instagram page that shows Theraguns with big titties is a wolf or not, it is a wolf. And it's very much preying on people, selling them hopes and dreams, that's clearly been shown through research to not be true. So you and I, and, and really when it comes down to it, the purpose of this podcast is to try and be sheepdog and say, listen, these are the things that unequivocally work. This is how you approach a musculoskeletal condition from an ethical, uh, from an academic and from a practical standpoint. And this is what you should expect from our results. This is what you should expect. This is how you differentiate between a wolf 
and not a wolf. And, and that's really what it comes down to. And I'd rather not, you know, I'd rather see less sheep and affect those less sheep with a greater magnitude than sell a million products at a 300% markup for $19.99 and be rich. Period. And the only reason I'm talking to you is because I know you agree with me. Right? The only reason why we associate ourselves with people and ideas is because we know that they agree with us. The whole principle of the system is that we're aiming to be a, a, a beacon of light. We're aiming to be guardians of a medical model in the musculoskeletal world that is overrun by wolves. So don't and that, be sheep. That is a killer way to wrap up this episode. What, what a fantastic rant to close it out. I love it. So let's close up this wolf pack for today. That was awesome. Yeah. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm emotional today. It's the quarantine's got me a little loony. Dude, maybe you should stay in quarantine for a while longer because that was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, brother. All right. I'll talk to you soon.